Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Son of a Blitch podcast. I'm your host, George Blitch. Today, I sat down with my good buddy, Freddie Cruz, and talked all about the different things that he's been a part of. He was a radio DJ for almost two decades here in Houston, Texas, a very well-known voice on the radio. Uh, he's then been an author, written three really cool books, and right now, he's uh, currently running Speak Podcast. So Speak Podcasting is S-P-E-K-E, and it's where you want to go if you're ready to launch your own podcast. He's going to walk you through all of the ins and outs of podcasting, how to market yourself, get your brand going, um, really kind of hone in on the analytics of what you need to do to be able to be the most successful in your avenue of interest. And, you know, he has been doing so many things over his lifetime that I really feel like he's probably the quintessential person to be able to talk to about taking your business to the other, other level. So even if it's a consulting thing, he's a guy to talk to about whatever it is you want to do, um, you know, going ahead and, and booking all these amazing uh, clients that he's done over the years. I mean, it, he's done everything. He's done everything. And he is just such a wealth of knowledge and he's a gentleman who shares that and is very open about his experience because it's not always pretty being an entrepreneur. And he talks about that and really kind of walks you through um, what it was like for him and what he wants to do and continue to pursue. Uh, we just had a great, great conversation. Uh, again, I highly encourage you guys to go down below, check out you know the socials, his website, follow him, follow his journey. He's always got something interesting to say, and he has really amazing guests. Um, I'm not plugging myself here. There are really great guests that he's got on there that you know you're going to learn something, and you know especially here around the Houston area, if you want to tap into uh, what's going on and get your pulse on on what's going on in our city. If you're listening from and around the Houston area, Freddie's your man. So guys, go check it out. This is a wonderful podcast. That's so much fun. Uh, make sure you follow all of socials. Uh, Freddie, as I mentioned before, they're all down below here in the description. And without further ado, here is my podcast with Freddie Cruz. Freddie, how are you doing today, man? Fantastic. Because I get to hang out with my man, George Blitch. That's how I was feeling when I woke up this morning. I was like, it's a Freddie day. It's going to be a damn good day. <laughs> For a split second, I thought you were going to say, that's how I felt. I get to hang out with George Blitch, the son of a Blitch all day. Wait a minute. That's me. That's scary, man. I don't know. I don't, I, you know, a whole day with that. It's it, this head, what's going on in here. I don't know. I don't know if I want to wish that upon other people. It's it's a busy mess. <laughs> Isn't it though? It's like it's, we get so trapped in our thoughts and you're like, hmm. If people only knew what was going on between my ears, I'd yeah. be fired, I'd be canceled, I'd be lambasted, I'd be quickly forgotten. I'd be so forgotten in less than five minutes after my inner thoughts are publicized. It's not even funny. I mean, it's funny, <laughs> but, but yeah. <laughs> oh, man. It, it's so true. There's so many things going on. I mean, you know that I have a few different projects always in the works, and I feel like uh, when we met each other, there's this kindred spirits of just like trying to project goodness into the world, but also busyness. Like you were involved in so many different things and you've had quite, you know, different various careers and things as well. Let's just like kind of start people off. Like what is, what is your normal day to day look like of what you're working on your projects and you know, what you got balancing with your, you know, speak podcasting with Freddie Cruz through HTX and you know, all the things that you're involved with. Let's just like lay it out for folks. Like, what does a day in Freddie's life look like? Well, um, busy, but I wake up uh, first thing in the morning and generally it's taken my daughter to cross country practice. She is a chip off the old block, so to speak, likes to run. I love to run. Um, so it's getting her out to practice, getting uh, lunches ready and, and somehow fitting a 30, 45 minute exercise uh between that and starting my day it's not one of those oh well i meditate for a half an hour then i journal for 45 minutes it's not one of those things that's yeah, like 55 minutes plunge. right right 55 <laughs> yeah um but generally speaking i think that when when you're in business for yourself um you know we joke around about our inner thoughts and and one of the things that i've come to realize is that your mental if you don't have physical health, your mental health is never going to catch up. And so I feel like I'm not myself if I don't at least get a minimum four to five days out of the week of, of some sort of rigorous exercise. And so I generally do that. And then it's, um, it's whatever the projects are calling for. 
So um, at the time of this recording, uh, we are uh, coming up on the end of Breast Cancer Awareness Month, one of my flagship clients with the podcast agency. Uh, we wrapped up 31 straight days of podcasts, which was insane, but also amazing mm -hmm. for anybody listening who has a podcast and maybe wants to know how to grow your show and your audience. It's the reps. It's uh, what Alex Hormozzi says, quality and quality. Yep. So quantity and quality, and you only get to quality by doing quantity. So the more you do it, the better you get. And of course, the more you're going to grow and it snowballs and snowballs. I've seen it firsthand looking at the back end analytics. We have quintupled our listenership just in, and I mean, we've again, at it's what October 23rd. So we still have another week left of October, uh, another week left in the month. And and we still got room to grow. And I'm just like, this is all everything that the podcast experts, the people who know far more about this than I do, everything they say, it is actually working. Um, so yeah, it, it's it's producing for clients and driving driving out to um to their offices. And I do some uh part-time marketing work for a local animal shelter, and and so yeah, it's it's trying to grow the thing and you know how it is when you're a, a small business owner and trying to leave a dent in the world before you leave and hopefully make, you know, hopefully make it a better place than when you got here. So. Indeed, man, it's lots of work, lots of hours and like putting in those reps, I think is the most important thing. You know, obviously yeah. now I think I got about 50 podcasts in the bag and I look back on the first few and I'm looking at it like, Ooh, wow. I, I could, Oh, I could have sharpened that up a little bit there and this and that. And I even had to tape down on in front of my laptop. Don't say awesome. Cause I'd always be like, Oh, it's awesome. <laughs> Just the things you learn. Like now I look back, I'm like, Oh yeah, I need to redo that one. I'm going to call the client up. Hey, we're going to replace this, but you know, it, you get better with any, anything you do, whether it's, you know, it's kind of like, uh, I think about the Malcolm Gladwell, uh, book, you know, it's like about, you know, the 10,000 hours, you know, the things yeah. that you put into it and like what, Eventually, you, if you will master a craft, if you put the time into it, it's just a, a matter of those reps. So, you know, I, I, I think that's a, a very important thing to cue in on. And I, I kind of wanted to also chat a little bit about the idea of like, this is kind of something in the more recent years for you, because before you were an on-air radio personality uh, here in Houston, a mainstay, uh, one of the best that, that I knew. And, you know, then you decided to move into kind of doing your own thing. So walk me through maybe a little bit of the history of what you did and what you, you know, kind of for our listeners in Houston, and then talk about that transition of deciding you're going to go out there and, uh, you know, what ultimately ended up to you hiring yourself and maybe talk about some of the, you know, challenges and, and some of the, uh, you know, joys of, of going through that process. Ryan Holiday says ego is the enemy and my ego was really i never really saw myself as having one uh, but apparently the universe our creator thought that maybe i needed to be humbled a little bit and so um with that came in this fall of 2021 uh, a, a time to renegotiate my quote unquote deal with my previous employer and uh to keep a, the lo long story short i denied it and let them go and served out the remainder of my contract um, because I am a professional. And so <clears throat> I had um, <clears throat> I had told my wife, and this was a long time. The writing was already on the wall. Listen, I will tell anybody out there who works for it doesn't even have to be a major corporation. It could be a, a working for a family owned business. That if you see the writing on the wall, it is your responsibility to trust your gut, to rely on your instinct and start making plans. And I told my boss's boss at that time, I'm surprised y'all didn't fire me during COVID because in 2019, when they renegotiated my contract, it was made very clear to me that I was making too much money. And so... 2021 came and I'm like, yeah, you guys, you guys are right. <laughs> um, <clears throat> excuse me. So yeah. Um, fast forward to fall of 2021. 
And I tell my wife, I was right. I was right. Nobody wanted to believe me. And, but that's okay because can I curse? Yeah. I'm Freddie fucking Cruz and I'm going to find a job. This is yeah. going to be a, a cakewalk. It's going to be a, it's going to be so damn easy. It's going to be a cakewalk. Well, um, November passes, no job. December passes, no job. Okay, honey. Mid February by the latest. Mid February comes, no job. March comes, no job. April comes, no job. I'm in the middle of May, 400 plus applications, uh, 55 rejections, a handful of interviews gone awry that just didn't work out. Either I tanked or I didn't have the right experience. And I'm like, okay, well, um, this sucks, one. And uh, two, I'm going to go stir crazy because I'm not may making any money outside of some of the freelance stuff that I'm doing. And I got myself in this mess and I've got a wife and two kids and, you know, I'm not going to certainly not going to go back to my previous employer and beg them for my job back. In fact, I, I regretted my decision to leave uh, exactly twice and each time no more than 30 seconds because. I felt sorry for myself for that long. So in other words, almost no regrets. Um, and so I told my wife, I'm going to try this business thing and see how it goes. And wow, that's hard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when yeah. you, when all you know is corporate America from the time you graduate college or even before, because I worked uh, all through uh, college. So I, and my first job was at McDonald's. So that's all I've known is working within some sort of corporate apparatus. And now I'm on my own 48 um, at last year, 47. So going only knowing corporate America until the age of 47. And obviously, I've made some mistakes. Uh, some things have gone right and uh, much more has gone wrong. And the let me tell you, dude. I know you know this because you're you're in business too. Uh, the world is just indifferent. It's not yeah. you. It's not them. It's just indifferent. And so you have to pound your chest and talk about how proud you are of what you're doing. And because listen, if nobody nobody else believe if nobody will ever believe in you if you don't believe in yourself, as cliche as that sounds, is but it's true. You've got to. You have to will what it is you want. You have to will it into existence. And so it's how how bad do you want it? So I'm here and I mean, man, I just, um, I know there are a lot more people who are in far worse situations than I ever have been or ever will be. And so I just keep, I just keep that in mind. I'm not homeless. I'm not dead. I've got all of my physical and for the most part, mental, uh, faculties with me. And so just wake up and fight another day. And if I lose whatever, then I lose and just keep going. Well, and you're gaining it back the next day. I mean, you, you, yeah. you're you, just the way you were saying it when you first got on our, our call today is like, Hey, I woke up, I'm here, I'm alive, you know, time to start doing something. Um, and that you've always approached that thing since I've known you, uh, it seems like a very positive a viewpoint, but realistic. And that is true. It's like, yeah. Also you can't hang yourself uh, like on your, your past accomplishments and like be like, whatever you've done is what you've done. Every day is a new day. And like people can remember, Oh yeah, Freddie's done this, this, and this, you were mainstay in Houston. People knew your name everywhere, but that doesn't mean the next employer is going to be like, oh, okay, yeah, I'm going to sign you because of that. Like may not be the right set and setting, but I think all those things probably as difficult as they may have been at the times, help to callous you and strengthen you to be able to get to that next level and, and be able to create your own business. And let's talk about that. What was your goal? What were you trying to do? Because obviously you've got, you know, speak podcasting. Was that the thing that you kind of had this vehicle or did you have another vehicle and that just ended up being something that you grabbed along the way? Uh, let's kind of talk about what your vision was when you decided, all right, I'm going to do this on my own. What was this? And, and kind of maybe talk about what that's kind of evolved into today. I got angry because I did not get a job that was going to pay me about a third of what I made. And I made really good money. Uh, 
my previous employer really took care of me. Like they really took care of me between ratings, bonuses and paid appearances. I mean, I was doing really well. And so for that, I'll never disparage them. Right. You know, I, I never will. And I also don't believe in burning bridges most of the time. Sure. <laughs> most of the time. But most of the time. Some you got to light time. fire when you walk some, across. I right. get it. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> but let me tell you. Yeah. Um, but it really, I was angry at a job interview that I thought went well. And then I ended up not getting hired. Um, you're talking to somebody who had, as a community affairs director, booked, I don't know how many segments, how many interviews, how many guests from 2015 to 2021. So I had that experience and it was for a guest booking job and I didn't get it. And um, so then I went on their website and was looking at what they do. And I'm like, huh. I do that. Huh. I do that. Huh. I do that. Huh. Okay. (laughs) Well, maybe I should start my own agency and see how it goes. And wow, is it hard? (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) It is hard. I mean, you talk about getting your, your face kicked in and then you, you fall on the floor and then someone steps on your face and then they they pick you up like a bowling ball through your nostrils and then they drag you across the mud and then they then they take a baseball bat and then smash your knee in that's like that's entrepreneurship right <laughs> that is entrepreneurship and and that's just I'm, the first week yeah that's the first <laughs> week y'all don't um, know y'all don't know yeah <laughs> and, and it's funny because i was listening to uh, a podcast episode of uh, Tom Billiou on Impact Theory. He was talking to Cody Sanchez and they're both amazing business owners. And I credit, I credit people like that with a lot of my, a lot of my mindset toward, toward life and business. Um, But he says, entrepreneurship is getting your teeth kicked in over and over and the pain will all go away if you just quit quit wow and it goes away but there's some people who are just wired to want to embrace the pain like Dave, david goggins you know you yep. embrace the suck and navy seals exactly. that's their that's their credo right <laughs> yes um, yes yeah so i've learned to sort of like getting the shit kicked out of my out of me and so um here i am <laughs> But hey, look, we have we live in the suburbs. We're not far from you. We live in the burbs. Mm-hmm. Um, we're doing okay. I haven't, you know, there are a lot of people who go into business for themselves and 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 they blow through their life savings and they mortgage their house and they max out credit cards. And look, that's it's not a knock on anybody who does that. I personally don't think that you need to grow a business like that. I'm not trying to do I'm not trying to do that because I'm also a very practical entrepreneur. Uh, I'm working a part-time job to try and help sustain and and because I don't want to go under. I mean, I've told right. my wife, speak podcasting never dies. It will reiterate until I figure out how to make it a you know a huge company with a large imprint, but it's never going away. And if I have to do whatever, uh, oh, and here's the other thing, George. I applied to be a barista, not at Starbucks, but at a local, like really cool, hip and trendy shop over in our area. Uh-huh. And I couldn't even get before before going to the shelter. I couldn't even get a job as a freaking barista. And you talk about getting kicked in the nuts. I'm like, dude, I'm making coffee, man. I can't even get a job making coffee. You're overqualified, sir. <laughs> <laughs> it's I'm like, I, just, I want this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I want to make coffee. No, you don't understand. I want to work there. <laughs> I'm trying to put hours in, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'm like, yeah, and 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 I I say these things because I don't want I don't want sympathy. I want people to understand that just how hard it is. And um and so when when someone like me gets to like the next the top of the next mountain, whatever that mountain looks like, yeah. and if if, if <clears throat> someone is sees me in that that after of the before and after and they see that and like huh must be nice yeah let me tell you something son of a bitch yeah i didn't (laughs) used to have teeth (laughs) i've had them replaced multiple times yeah exactly exactly i'm these are veneers baby (laughs) (laughs) yeah no well i mean it's i think that when you see 
a lot of people don't see the ladder to success. They see people at the top and they think, mm -hmm. oh, they must have known someone done this. It's like, there's all these, you, you don't mm -hmm. ever really notice all the hours of hard work. Cause a lot of times people aren't showing that off. Like, you know, nowadays with, you know, social media and stuff, you can kind of see someone as they rise up and what the work they're doing. So there is some way to kind of track it. But a lot of times you just see someone, you're like, oh, wow, they're this. Well, man, you know, you look at someone like Chris Pratt and all the different work mm -hmm. and the things they put in. And, and then, you know, sometimes it is the lucky networking. Sometimes it is the right place in the right time. But those people also put themselves in that place. They put the in the time to be able to be able to have those next connections. And it's hard for people to sometimes understand and they'd be like, oh, yeah. well, you just did this. Yeah. But like your stories too, along the way, it hadn't been easy, but you're going to get to the next top of that mountain and you'll be able to look back. And that's when I feel like the journey is worthwhile. And it's something to be able to share with others that, yeah, it's going to be tough guys. It's not going to be easy. You yeah. got to put in the time, you got to put in the effort, got to put in the work. And if you do all those things, ultimately, I think there's, it's only a matter of being able to have some success in whatever form it is, at least being able to say, I went through that process and I tried my best. Maybe that wasn't for you. Maybe it's another door you got to go through. But I always kind of look at any type of work relationships or even, you know, relationships with friends or, or people that you're, you know, dating or whatever, like being able to say at the very end of those things, I did everything I could. I tried to make it work. I tried to do these things. I tried to be successful. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, if you decide to go a different direction, you can at least walk out with no regrets or maybe those two little 30 second regrets that you talked about. Like, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you just have to get used to, to losing. I think that we, we are so, and I don't know if this is a thing of the West or maybe it's just a human thing where we, we, um, we don't, we don't like losing. We don't like setbacks. I mean, I mean, I'll, who who really does like losing? I mean, you have to be okay with losing more often than you have to be okay with with you have to be okay with losing more often than winning is my yeah. point. And and it doesn't mean that I just celebrate and enjoy it. I'm just saying that if anything worth having is not going to come easy because if it if it came easy, you would be like um like I don't know, I don't really watch football that much anymore. But it'd be like I guess uh, the New England Patriots playing a third grade Pee Wee League football team. Where's the fun in that? Because you know they kick the dog snot out of those kids every single week. There's like no they challenge. were little entrepreneurs. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. I mean, it's uh, yeah, it's just it, yeah. it's not fun. It's like uh, yeah. when you're playing video games. Um, when you're playing video games and, and you just beat level one of Super Mario Brothers over and over and over and over and over, and then at some point it gets really boring and and you're like, okay, why don't we get to the next boss level? Let's get to the next boss level. We can do this. It was like I never really understood that playing with uh, my friends, where if uh, if they would get angry about what was happening in the game and then they just switch the game off. Yep. Like, dude, what the hell's wrong with you? I was about to score a touchdown. Yeah, I was about to score a Tag touchdown. Ball, baby. Yeah. 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 It's um just have to suck it up, buttercup. That's right, man. That's right. <laughs> I want to circle back into yeah. speak podcasting and like what yeah. it is that you're offering, folks. Cause I know, you oh. know, we had a, a, a little bit of a communication with with one yeah. of my friends who was looking to start a podcast. Yeah. And you know, I don't know where were you when I was trying to start? I could have used your wisdom, my friend. <laughs> but you have such a an elaborate background of, of being able to book guests, be comfortable uh -huh. talking with them. I mean, you know, I'll, I'll throw this in real quick and we can chat about it later, but you know, you and I met while you were interviewing Jack Carr, uh, yeah. from the Terminalist series author, um, author of six amazing books, seventh is on the way. And, you know, walked into murder by the book. And, uh, you know, first thing I looked down and we'll have to get to this. I was like, Oh, there's Freddie Cruz book. Okay. And there's a Jack Carr book. So we got to talk about your books as well, but, I look in and I'm like, man, this guy is awesome. And then I realize later on, oh yeah, radio personality in Houston. I know your voice. I know your name. Didn't connect him that first day, but you and I got to chatting and kind of communicating a little bit and, you know, has forged, forged a friendship here, but you've done all sorts of different things. And like, I feel like when people come to you, there are multiple avenues of experience that you can talk about. But I really want to kind of, you know, give you a minute to talk about what it is that you offer uh, clients and what it is that, you know, you walk them through and how you can help build their business. Yeah, my goal is for there to be thousands and thousands of people who I've helped 
launch podcasts because this is the future. Everybody should have every. Let me back up. Mm-hmm. Everybody should be a podcaster because if I if I were to say everybody should have a podcast, that means you know George and Freddie can go and start an episode, not get Joe Rogan numbers, and then quit ap- after episode two. So I want everybody to be a podcaster. Anybody who is listening who is interested in some strange quirk, that's a podcast right there. That is at least six months worth of material, which, by the way, puts you in the top 1% of creators. Okay, So my goal is to is to rally up as many people who are tired of waiting to get discovered by the gatekeepers in the big media uh, companies. Uh, they're tired of waiting on gatekeepers. They're tired of trying to figure out the the algorithms. This is what this is what podcasting can do, where you take true ownership over the story of your brand or your personal brand, your your company or what have you. It could be big, it could be small, it could be just a local run uh, sort of pop up shop thing, like what your daughter Ellie has. That's yep. a podcast right there, Ellie with her mom and dad going to different places. And so, um, what I do is really, really, it's it's multiple layers. So it's consulting. And helping people guide, uh, helping guide people through um, what their what their title should be, and then the, how long their episode should be, how frequently they should be doing their episodes, and really mapping out what uh, what what their first twenty, thirty, or whatever episodes are going to look like. Having a plan uh, because you can have an awesome idea for a show about hunting feral hogs. Uh-huh. That's a nod to our previous interview. You can have an amazing <laughs> show about hunting feral hogs and cooking them, right? But if you don't have a plan for, well, week one is going to be why hunt feral hogs. Week two is going to be how to cook a feral hog. Week three is going to be a, the easiest recipe. Week four, we're going to bring a chef. So you have to have a plan for execution. Then you go and you execute and you execute without any regard for back end analytics because with podcasters if i had to guess with podcasters we it, we treat we treat these precious download numbers the way somebody would treat an instagram like mm-hmm. they're to a certain extent vanity metrics yes downloads matter just as much as likes matter it, it's um it's sort of a um letting you know that you're doing something right that you're going in the right direction yeah but let's be honest downloads can me- mean anything from freddie hit play for a minimum one second all the way to george hit play and listen to the entire episode so there's a wide range of what one single download means right you go into the apple backend analytics and you've got um 40% uh, an engaged listen is when someone listens for a minimum 40% of an episode. So it's really coaching people to do an episode, uh, record record a show that's going to be long enough to cover what they want to cover, but not too long to where it's just three hours of, holy shit, is this thing ever going to end? <laughs> I've been, I've, I have recorded some three plus hours one. Now it was Great content for those who stayed with, but yeah, yeah, you're right. It's most, most listeners don't have that kind of time. No, no, you know what? And they don't. And, and really, uh, one of my favorite, one of my favorite shows is, uh, the Andrew Huberman, the Huberman lab with Andrew Huberman, Huberman, the, uh, neuroscientist. And mm-hmm. this guy goes off most, on most cases, uh, by himself for a really long time and, it's like, I want to learn about the brain, but man, I don't know if I could sit through two hours. Are your classes even that damn long? <laughs> Probably not. Cut it down, sir. <laughs> Cut it down. But I mean, hey, look, he ranks really high in the Apple charts, so he obviously knows something oh, it, that I don't. And Joe and Rogan, right? I mean, Joe we, Rogan. We, look at, we look at folks like that. It's regularly two, three hours. You know, I've seen some longer. It's and, oh, and, but man. It's yeah, amazing. That Post Malone interview was four. Dude, I saw that. I I have not finished the whole thing. I'm probably halfway through, but I remember just looking that up. I was like, is that a typo? Like, <laughs> it has to be. But then I think about this, like two guys having fun, having good conversations. Can't Why tell not? you how many times that I've I've talked with people for so long and you're like, oh my gosh, it's this hour or yeah. my phone has died or whatever it may yeah. be. You know, good conversations. Yeah. And those two, 
and a lot of the guests he has on. And there's just so much breadth of knowledge and experience that, yeah, you could feel that. I mean, if podcasting was a thing and Joe Rogan was alive back in the time of Christ, that episode would be like 10 hours. (laughs) Let's be honest. It'd be 10 hours and Jesus would probably be a repeat guest the way one of his, the way his UFC fighters are. Let's be real. Marcus Aurelius too. I mean, you know. And then, and go. then people would lambast him for wanting to talk to I don't know uh, Herod, King Herod. <laughs> I'm interviewing everyone, everyone. Come on, come yeah, on. I'm interviewing everybody. Hey, look, I'm I'm gonna talk. I'm gonna talk to the king of the Mongols over here. I mean, next week we're gonna. It's a diversity of a uh, of a uh, guest of guests. Yeah, no, but uh, yeah, I just uh, I'm obsessed with podcasting and really helping uh, helping people who would not otherwise have a broadcast career like the one I had or the one that current insert the name of your favorite radio personality yeah. has. I want people to understand that they have a voice. They can use it because everybody is interesting at something and podcasting is the way to go. If you don't want to be on video, you don't have to be on video. If you only want to do audio, Hey, you can talk, you can hide behind the mic because you don't ever want to be on camera. That works out perfect. And then if you're doing it as sort of a vehicle for driving business, you can use all of your podcast episodes, whether they are audio or video or both. And you could, you can turn them into a a sort of a content avalanche. You can adapt them for Instagram and Facebook reels, TikTok videos, YouTube shorts, because YouTube is the second largest Google, uh, second largest search engine next to Mm -hmm. Google. Hello, they're owned by Google. You can take the transcripts, insert a favorite quote of yours over a static image of you behind the scenes doing whatever. If you're a baker, Uh, I don't know. These these are just things that you could do. Yeah. No, it's it. There's multiple platforms. I mean, it's something that's it. It can springboard to whatever it is you want. And mm-hmm. you know, I, I mean, I, I I know that even after you know we had our interview, you send me over some stuff. It's like some really cool video content, text overlay, and things too that are these little snippets where you can throw that in. Hey, there's your reel. There's something to attract a small bit to get someone to have a bigger bite. And you know, a lot of times. That's kind of what you need, but there's things you can just do embedded. And there's a lot of different types of AI interaction and availability these days where things can kind of generate themselves, which is wild. You know, like I was very much um, not into the even, you know, your AI and like I, I just never even looked much into things. And then I start seeing it's like, yeah, you can upload your audio and then all of a sudden it will give you these suggestions on stuff where it's like. Now I see that as a tool. Did it come out perfect? No. But was I able to edit it? And it was like, okay, well, it's using the words that we use during this interview. It's really kind of truncating things and being able to maybe put up chapter markers. And maybe this one I want to move over here. But at least it gave me, it was almost like a rough draft instead of me having to start from scratch. It's like I already did the work. I did the research for a couple of weeks on that guest. And then I recorded it. And it's like, you've done all this work. And it almost like... I I think at first I was afraid of having that be like a, a cheat code. You know, it's like, I wanted to go and do all this, but then I realized sometimes um, I need to make sure if I'm a one man shop running something, which I am mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. my time is valuable. And that's something it's like, I've, I've already done it. If I can just have something else spit back and generate some things for me to work with, it's pretty valuable and useful man you know <laughs> i don't it's know like what having, your take on is it yeah it's like having your own personal assistant yes. it's like having you as your own personal assistant because you're yeah. the one putting the inputs into the chat bot um so with chat gpt uh, you don't just say hey i'm interviewing george blitch can you write up some questions for someone who's an outdoorsman who likes to hunt mm-hmm. you don't you don't do that you put in sort of a, a bio and then you put in use these parameters and make 15 questions and then it comes out um i love using it for drafting um drafting email newsletters um i've done this before for in numerous different uh sort of uh contexts and it works so beautifully because like you said the rough draft part is already done. And then you go and you're like, okay, that sucks. That sucks. I'm going to move that there. Oh, golly. Yeah. I would never let that fly. And let me tell you, man, you can tell when someone is dependent completely upon AI, because the thing that I've noticed the the most is how redundant it can be. Yeah. Um, and so when you start to pick up on 
on like a third way of someone saying something within five sentences, you're like, yeah, that person didn't even go and prune it. Right. Um, and, and hey, to each their own. These people are obviously um, way more successful than I am. So it works, I guess. <laughs> But I guess that's too like what you, like the idea of like the merit of your success. If you're constantly advancing and learning and sharpening mm-hmm. your craft, you know, you're getting better at that. And you're, you know, the the way that like I look at like interviews and my ability now to like be able to sit down and talk with someone. Before I used to spend a week writing down these twenty three questions or whatever it would be, and now mm-hmm. it's like I realize I can just pivot and just have these real conversations that I would normally have with someone sitting across from, mm-hmm. and I feel more comfortable being able to do that. I don't have anything in front of me to ask you any questions today, and <laughs> a year ago that would not have been the case. Now oh, I know yeah. enough about you, and there's things I want to ask you, and you know, and I feel like we've already had a great start with that, but like I don't, I, I'm getting better at it. I still am not as sharp as some of these other people. I look at, you know, the Rogans of the world or other folks who are, you know, going on and, you know, the Tim Ferriss and things. It's like, wow, these guys, but you put in the work and stuff. You don't necessarily have to go through the notes and you can just kind of walk your way through it. And it becomes very authentic, you know, but you're teaching people that are coming to you how to do these things, how to use these tools, maybe with AI, how they can be able to help build their brand successfully. You've had that experience and so I I feel like it's the most authentic person that I could think of. Whenever anybody asks me, I'm going to send them your way. And like, thank you, man. He knows. Oh, of course, man. Of course. And yeah, go ahead. No, you go ahead. I was going to ask you, you know, pivoting now to your other, you know, kind of creations. Let's talk about that book that I saw or the books rather when I'm walking into murder by the book and you have written how many books now is it? Three, and I'm done for. Uh, I'm done for now. <laughs> okay, so talk to me about those. Is that something you always wanted to do? How did you know the first one come about, and then you know how those other two roll into? And like, have you always been a writer? Is this something that you're like, I'm going to challenge myself? And you know, what did that look like as far as the beginnings of your path as an author? Yeah. I have always been a writer, but in the copywriting sense of the word writer, Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of what I did in my previous radio career was writing promo copy. So anything from a five second little one liner thing to 30 seconds to upwards of, you know, show notes, basically the the equivalent of podcast show notes or Mm -hmm. show prep or whatnot. So I've always written and very effectively to um, the Marconi Awards, you know, I probably played a couple of uh, uh, small roles in us winning those. But, um, you know, in 2018, we were at Barnes & Noble one night. It was a wacky Saturday night, me and my wife and my two daughters at Barnes & Noble burning the house down. It was crazy. And so uh, we were walking through the book section. And then one of my daughters was like, dad, you should write a book. I'm like, really? What do you think it should be about? I don't know, but you should write a book. And I'm like, hmm, well, I've always thought it'd be kind of cool to to have a book. And I think people sort of gravitate toward that. Hey, yeah, it'd be cool to have a book. And then they just never do it because sure. it's, um, it's, it's funny. You mentioned Tim Ferriss. Yeah, it's a lot of work. You mentioned Tim Ferriss. And I think he, I forget who he was talking about. But it was essentially everybody wants to have a book, but not everybody wants to write a book. And that's sort of the same the same sort of uh, notion or the same sort of mentality toward having a podcast. Everybody wants to have a podcast, but nobody wants to be a podcaster because being a podcaster means George and Freddie are putting in the work of research. We're editing and posts. We're, you know, scheduling. We're making we're managing schedules and and so, yeah, that's, that's a tall order for somebody who doesn't do these. And that maybe that's why there's a, that's why there's so many zombie podcasts out there. But so my, uh, back to the books, my kids had dared me to write a book, challenged me, so to speak. And, and, uh, so the novelty of the challenge for dad wore off and I was left with, okay, I'm not going to just say that I'll write a book and then not. And, and then not write that check that I, you don't write a check your ass can't cash, especially right. when it comes to your kids. 
And so I'm not going to let them down, but what do I write about? Well, they're obviously not paying attention because nothing dad does is cool anymore. What? Uh, so <laughs> I don't know. Say. So, don't sorry say. to let you guys down, man. If you got <laughs> young kids, you will eventually not be cool. Um, but so I'm like, all right, well, I need to make sure this is fun. And so in 2018, um, as you and, and the audience may know, uh, that was when a certain person was holding one of the higher offices in the world and things were really nasty, uh, just all over the place. And so I thought, hmm, how can I not keep from engaging with people on the Internet? Oh, I'll write a book about repealing the First Amendment to the United States and show everyone what a real tyrant looks like. <laughs> And so, um, and so it's funny because my developmental editor to this day still has no idea what side of the political aisle I, I stand on, uh -huh. which is good. So I, I, in that sense, really did my job. The Houston press had other words for me. Um, uh, they said it was like a terrible libertarian book. Um, they called my president who got assassinated Trumpian and I'm like, no, nah, no, I don't think so. Um, probably more like Ron Paul, but I don't even, I even hesitate to say that. Um, but yeah, so that was a fun book to write. Um, and with anybody who ever wants to go the indie, the indie route of writing is like, you really have to know yourself because you can put out a big heaping stack of garbage if you don't really really seek out some help like you have to like you can there's a fine line between confidence and arrogance especially when it comes to something like a book because in jack carr you got the book in the background and uh you know i've interviewed the guy and i've listened to his podcast enough where he's like time is all we have essentially you're you're asking someone to buy your book it's that is an investment of somebody's time that they just do not get back. And right. so um, not comparing myself to, to Jack Carr by any stretch of the imagination, I had fun writing it. Um, and if the Houston press murdered it, then it must've been somewhat decent. <laughs> so, uh, and then the second book um, they canceled the DJ. Um, I wrote that in a fit of rage because it was, uh, I, I started, conceptualizing the book after the the negative review i use anger as a tool a lot uh -huh. as you might be able to uh infer from our conversation <laughs> um it's a good and i tool. believe it, it is a good tool and i believe in using i believe in using all the emotions um uh as tools for for getting to where you want to go and i would even say using happiness if you yeah. like if you like seeing your loved ones happy well guess what you should probably do more of that mm -hmm. uh more of what's working so that you can keep them happy um, but yeah, I believe in using anger, sadness, indifference, um, all as tools. And so, um, I wrote that one funny story during the freeze of 2021, I wrote longhand 10 pages in the dark, uh, by candlelight simply because I wanted to know how the old school people did it back in the day before yeah. electricity and heat. And, um, it was fun. I forget what chapter that might've been. But it was fun. Froze my ass off. But uh, <laughs> I thoroughly enjoyed that. And then there's Allow Me to Ruin Your Christmas, which um, was probably the most fun book I wrote uh, out of the three. I enjoy writing, uh, but it was more of sort of a, a projection against like the um, the happy-go-lucky sort of Christmas like it's a Christmas miracle y'all and happy, happy endings and, and Hallmark movies and the, the boy gets the girl and gross, you know, life is not happy endings. Life can sometimes be very miserable and it could be made miserable by the people closest to you. So, um, that was really, uh, a sort of, a, a, a reflection on my disdain with, with, um, the holiday season just being so, I don't know, caricatured in a very toxically positive way. Mm -hmm. um, and so I had fun dancing. Uh, you know, we, we all, uh, we all have a shadow and I enjoyed dancing with my shadow for that book. It was, 
And the last chapter was probably the best thing I've ever put together in my entire life. That and the halfway, the midway point, the climax where things start to go go downhill. Of course, I've been told that it go, goes downhill from chapter one, but I'm talking where shit hits the fan, like when it gets violent. Um, it's first person alternating characters. So you're inside the mind of Beckett, and then the next chapter it's Lex, and they're both told first person. And um, ah, I liked it. So you say you're done with with the books. Is there some other type of project or something that you want to create? I mean, you've you you checked that list off, right? You're like, I did that. Is there something else that someone else has maybe inspired you to want to go after? I mean, I'm not necessarily saying you're gonna you know write an opera and perform it here in in Houston (laughs) um, for us all, but maybe there's something. Maybe did I did I guess that? But is there something that you are like, you know what? I want to make sure I accomplish that one of these days. Is there some kind of bucket list for you with what you want to do? No, I'm just really angry at the way things have turned out with, uh, with writing. And I never set out to, to, I never set out to be a Stephen King or a Brad Thor. Um, I've just, uh, the past two books as, and again, as an indie author, you are the owner of, uh, of your destiny right um and and so i would advise anybody who writes independently to really know who you're entering a partnership with so for instance the second book and this is all just since june okay yeah. um the publisher for the second book went under and I haven't got paid my royalties and I only knew they went under because I was reached out to by a fellow writer who hasn't even gotten her book. So she Ooh. paid a bunch of money down. She paid in full before the book turned out and she still doesn't have a book. And apparently I'm one of the lucky ones because at least I got a book. At least I got something. Now, I haven't gotten paid any royalties, but at least I have a book. There are people who pay thousands of dollars and don't have a book, George. That is a travesty. So that's one. And then two, um, again, going back to as an being an independent author, you having to really take on the lion's share of your work. And of course, the traditionally published people, um, they don't tell you that they also don't really market you very well they probably market you a little bit um if you're a big name they market the crap out of you right but if you and i were to get a traditionally published deal we we'd essentially be on our own that's why people say that it's always best to go indie and i'm telling you yes that is true to a certain extent as long as you are okay with knowing that you could get dropped even by your indie publisher which is what happened to me with allow me to ruin your Christmas. So effective November 15th, I'm not sure when this episode goes out, but effective November 15th, they will no longer carry my book. So that's all happened in less than six months. And so I'm done writing for now. And uh, I eventually do want to have a a library of books that I've written. Um, It's just that right now I'm, I'm very um, right now. The author world is, I shouldn't say the author world, the publishing world is dead to me. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, I just, um, I need to, I need to figure out how I'm going to play in that sandbox because I do want to play. I want to go back and play in that sandbox. It's like, um, you know, there are a bunch of scorpions in there and I'm not going to go in the sandbox. So there are a bunch of scorpions. I'm going to figure out when I can go in and, and when I decide time is right, then I'll go back and, and start writing. Sure. And also, also I've started three books since last year is it three yeah three i've started three books since last year and have not finished any one of them uh because i've gotten inside my head and so i think a lot and then and then this happened and i'm like yeah i just need to stop i need to stop and just really get get things get my other affairs in order because maybe that's uh my subconscious saying that you're not, you're not in a place to do it. 
Well, you got to be in the right set and setting. I mean, I I just recently interviewed uh, Jim Shockey, who he talked about writing the first few words of his book and then realizing now's not the time and 25 years later finished it. Now, yeah. he had a lot of life in between those 25 years, which allowed him to then be able to write that part of the book because a lot of it was autobiographical in nature. But those experiences helped shape what he wrote later on. And if he didn't have those experiences, that book never would have come to be. So maybe you're just supposed to go and do those things now for that yeah. future book to come out. Yeah, absolutely. And I have, um, oh, I forget what they call it. I forget what they call it, but it's, uh, I have a, I have a manuscript that will never see the light of day. There's a technical word for it. <sighs> I'm not even going to try to remember, but I have a, I have an entire manuscript that I wrote longhand uh -huh. and it was kind of fun, but it will never see the light of day. Uh, just because I, I don't know that it's, I don't know that it's workable, editable. I just, I just wrote it for me just to see yeah. if I could. Yeah. And, uh, I did that whole, um, they call it the Pomodoro method where mm -hmm. you write for 30 to 45 minute time uh, at 45, 30 to 45 minutes at a time, sort of like writing sprints throughout the day. And holy crap, I finished it in like two months. It works. Nice. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, it really, that method really works now with all the things that I've got going on. I don't know if I could do it. Of course I say, I say that, but I mean, I was, at the time working my radio gig where I had three freaking duties that were all full-time jobs. And then I was doing work for corporate. And then I was also uh, doing all the other things. So, I mean, I could do it. I think it's just, do I want to? Probably yeah. not. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, if you focus on it and you set your sights on that, but if that's not what you're, you're wanting to go after and you, you're so busy with all the other things you're doing right now, maybe there's a day for that next you know, chapter yeah. that next, so to speak, the next book, you yeah. know, the next manuscript, the next story, whatever it may be. Um, you know, I, I, before we, we wrap up, I really wanted to, I, I've been curious about this with all my guests, but especially with you, who's done so many wonderful things. I wanted to know about what you view your legacy that you want it to be. What is it? How do you want to be remembered whenever you're looking back on this or whenever other people are looking back and they're saying, that Freddy Cruz, he's a hell of a guy. Here's these things that I remember about him. You know, I'm totally curious about that idea of what that is that people will be able to look back and, and see, and you want to exemplify your life and, and whatever, you know, way you want to explain that. I'm going to refer you to the last page of they canceled the DJ. And it's just uh, two sentences with no context. So I'm not giving away anything. Right. And these are not the last two sentences. There are other words. Okay. 99% of us will be forgotten in 99 years. And 99% of the world will never know of this unfortunate turn of events. And so at the end of the day, does it matter? <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. I want to think, I want to think it does. Um, listen, I am the product of an unplanned pregnancy. And my kid, my parents had me at a very young age. My kids were brought here, not that way. And so I can't help be but believe that there's some sort of higher power that put me here not to be mediocre, but to do something large. And I've got the audacity to think that I can. And I don't know how long it'll take. I don't know if that happens before the end of 2023. Here we are in late October. I don't know if that's going to happen next year. I don't know if it'll happen in 2030. I don't know if I have to go freaking bankrupt and get sued and my family disowns me before I come out from the shadows of darkest places in one's life. I hope it doesn't come to that because I don't think that's necessary. I really don't think that you have to hit rock bottom to accomplish amazing things in your life and in your career. All that to say, um, 50 years after I'm gone, I would like, in case there's not a nuclear war that destroys everything, 
I'll throw that caveat out there. But Barring 50 that. years, <laughs> yeah, 50 years after I'm gone, I would love for people who are in my bloodline to go back to watching an episode like this mm-hmm. or reading a book. If there's still a book, I know we talked about my two previous ones being out of print, but they'll be on sale somewhere. They've, um, <laughs> there will be an eBay in the future. We hope. Yeah. there. Yeah. There will be an eBay in the future. And so it's, they'll see something like a podcast interview with son of a blitch, or they'll read a book like they canceled the DJ and they'll be like, you know, life was so simple back then. And we've got all these luxuries and I don't know how they did it. What is this Facebook thing? It's so antiquated and, and actual physical books. People did that. Like they actually turn pieces of paper. What the hell? This chapter um, almost looks like it was maybe written by candlelight. Written by candlelight. People drove cars. Like people actually like cars had actual tires on them. And now we fly. And so they look at, at, at my life and realize how hard they think I might've had it, which I don't, I have hard days, but my life is not difficult. Mm-hmm. But they'll look at my life and they'll look at the things that I did and they'll realize how I got there. And they'll, on a rough day, they'll be like, if he did that, then I can do it too. And I owe it to my future self to go out there and at least try my fucking hardest. Dude, love it. That is one of the more epic answers and final words of a legacy question. It's so true, though, man. And you have that they can look back on all the different things you've done. You've produced so many things. There's interviews. There's, you know, your books. There's the podcast, the other people that you've helped launch in their careers, too. And there's so much left for them, so many breadcrumbs to follow your history. And I love how you're talking about, you know, your future self and who you owe it to, because that's. You know, I think there was a quote I heard, and I'm probably butchering a little bit, but he goes, the guy talks about, you know, his legacy and stuff. He's like, I want the eight-year-old me and the 80-year-old me to be proud of what I've done. And I was like, that's pretty cool. So he's like, he talks about every day, making sure that that kid and that, you know, as your time is setting, looking back on what you've done and accomplished. Um, Freddie, thank you so much for joining me today. I know that there's going to be tons of people who want to learn more about you and where to follow you. So why don't you go ahead and give me your socials, website your business and kind of give people a path to follow your awesome career and maybe help theirs blossom along the way. I really appreciate the time, my man. The website is speakpodcasting.com and speak is a combination of the words Sparrow and Zeke, which are my two dogs. Uh, So S-P-E-K-E podcasting.com. And from there, you can link up to the socials. I got a new, I got two newsletters. I got the cruise through HDX, uh, which is the podcast. So cruise through HDX available wherever you get your shows and listen to the interview with the son of a blitch, uh, where we talk about feral hunting and, uh, and all the good stuff and owning a business with your family. And so you can go back to that episode, make that, make that the first one you listen to. And then the second right. recommendation will be a 77 year old fitness influencer joe mcdonald so those two will be my first my top two recommendations for you when you uh, acquaint yourself with uh, what i'm doing and so yeah uh that's where you can find me link up and uh, i'm happy to hear from you and help you in any way uh any way i can once again thank you for for joining the podcast thank you for your friendship man i i I just love hanging out with you, connect with you. You give me some fuel to my fire as well. And uh, looking forward to many more collaborations in the future, man. Who knows what we're going to be doing together. But I know there's going to be something fun down the road. So thanks again. And everyone, uh, make sure you go check out all the wonderful things Freddie's doing. Thank you, sir. We will talk soon. Appreciate you, George. All right. Take care.